Nice, nice, nice. There is a chance, a possibility, even if it's a small one, that you might get the chance to see two wizards in the one single game in this 1v1. The Saruman from Isengard and Ganda of the Grey, later on Ganda of the White from the Man of the West faction. We have the yellow Isengard play Archangel on the left side against the blue Man of the West player Ectilion on the right side. And once again, this is the map, Firiandale. Looks like that. So pretty nicely designed. And I gotta be honest, I think BFME 2 guys are the most active ones when it comes to make new maps for the 1v1 2v2 scene, you know? And having those new maps in every single tournament is so nice. Because I'm kind of bored of seeing the Forts of Ice in every single time. <laughs> Two farms into the third farm coming up from the Man of the West into the farm number 4. Ectilion likes that. Ectilion actually likes to open with 4 farms at the beginning of the game regardless what faction he's playing. So I believe there's like a pretty good strategy building four farms at the beginning of the game just to make sure that you have great amount of resource income and great amount of command points but it's also kind of risky because if the archangel would go for the early barracks which is not the case by the way he would be able to deal crazy amount of economical damage but he's gonna build two furnaces uruk pit and the third furnace right after and you can see one of the major differences here the placement of the furnaces so furnaces are one of the squishiest resource buildings in the entire game they have only a little bit more than a thousand HP, thousand ET. You know, meaning of course that you can, as your as the opponent player, destroy these furnaces in no time. And for that reason, building them in a safe spot, like in the range of the fortress, is actually very important. Remember, in Rise of the Witch King, you always want to build your, you know, slaughterhouses, furnaces, or whatsoever around 97% mark to get the maximum value of the resource income, which is 25. But here, this is not the priority. Priority is to keep them. Protected at the early game. Very important. Urukai are coming from the Uruk pit into the crossbowmen next. They are also kind of cheap. They cost 325 each. Uruks, they are even cheaper. They cost 300 only. On the other side, we see, yeah, stable and barracks coming up at the same time. But you can see it's a bit delayed, you know. And I believe the Urukai, if they would go straight through the middle, they would be, you know, easily able to destroy this farm. But again, the farms are a bit more tanky in compared to the furnaces. Snowhound, welcome. Thanks for tuning in, man. Hope you're going to enjoy your stay. Welcome, welcome. Powerpoint-wise, Isengard was picking up the vision of Palantir. In Man of the West, didn't pick anything just yet. Palantir will be now used. Palantir, besides giving you vision, also increases your movement speed by 15%. The builders are trying to body block them. Do you see that? I, uh, what? Why not Warchan? I don't get it. What is... <laughs> the builders, what are they doing? I mean, he can just turn on them, right? The builders, by the way, also very important to mention, are tankier in BFME 2 than in Rise of the Witch King. Rallying Call is going to be used on the soldiers, on the Skonda Knights, I mean, sorry. And then the trample damage is coming in clutch. His calf units are, of course, a great counter to the Swordsman of any faction. This includes also the mighty Urukai. Even though their armor is thick and their shields broad. But apparently, their shields are not broad enough. Crossbow man, in the meantime, trying to creep the, uh, the war clear. The Vorks are able to trample down your, your units here, which makes the creeping a bit more challenging in compared to BFME 1 or to Rise of the Witch King. Vork is coming up next. But there comes the counter harassment. And Isengard was only able to destroy one of the farms. And remember, Man of the West player was opening with four farms, so losing one of the four isn't a big deal. Okay, nice positioning with the Pikeman. Oh, bad, bad trample. He's gonna take so much damage from the trample. He is microing around, trying to micro around, but. He's taking way too much damage here for no reason. One more Pikeman. Beautiful micro here from Archangel, actually. He's managing it to get into the back line and killing almost the full battalion of crossbowmen just like it did. Tower Guard is, you know, the Pikeman from Gondor are dealing actually a great amount of damage to the Warp Pit. They almost were able to take it down. The Furnaces, like mentioned at the beginning of the video, look at that. They are getting blown up, guys. They are so squishy. That's crazy. That's really crazy. 350 command points for Isengard, and Ectilion, the Man of the West player, has 400 command points right now. From the Knights, they are still alive, they are also level 2, which means sustain over time, but again, that's not a big, you know, that's not a big deal for the Man of the West faction, because all you gotta do is build one single mill and you are good to go. So lots of pressure on Isengard, definitely. More Gondor Knights, maybe? Um, not anytime soon. He has only one single Gondor Knight so far, but he's also expanding offensively at the very same time. Which is pretty nice. I like that. 
double barracks to keep spamming units all the time, soldiers, tower guards, all you gotta need. But Isengard was kind of able to defend himself, at least for now. 454 men off the west, and Isengard is down to 400. But again, the difference isn't that huge that the game has decided just yet. And I've seen many, many great comebacks in BFME 2, and this is nothing you cannot come back from, you know? So Man of the West has also the buff. Remember, Palantir is not the best ability when it comes to fights. You know, army against army. Kribane or the Warchan would be a better choice. Rallying Call is going, uh, Rallying Call is going to be used. Looks like you want to creep the trolley with the tower guards. Should not be a problem, oh. As Pikes are able to kill these trolls in no time. Palantia, of course, is kind of useless in those kind of situations because the movement speed increase doesn't really matter anything if you're going to stand still and fight. You know what I'm saying? Trample. He has no pikemen around this area. Gone the knights. Be careful. Oh, no, that hurts. Losing the level 2 there is going to hurt him a lot. Can he actually get the creep? Uh, can, can he get the money with the Vork Riders, though? At least one. Two parts of the money stolen too. What a great situation here for the Greek, play Greek player Archangel. I like that. Very well done. 454 men of the West. And Isengard was able to get even more than that. He has 6 power points collected after the vision of Palantir. Actually, Isengard is right now kind of leading the game. That's crazy. Tower guards are, you know, slower of course than Urukai. Urukai are able to run them down. And they might be potentially taken down. It's a level 3 unit. That's going to hurt you. Try to save them. Remember, at level 3, they will be moving 5% faster. And also at level 5 and level 7. So when you get them level 7, they will be moving 15% faster. Human Wood for the armor buff. Beautiful trample with the Rohirrim this time. Rohirrim, of course, the elite cavalry unit from the Man of the West faction in BFME 2. And with the Rohirrim and Gondor soldiers and the Human Wood, which grants you 35% increased armor, he will be able to win this fight. If also the first hero of the game, that's of course Lutz, nobody else. One of the most cost-efficient heroes in the entire game trilogy, in all battle for Middle Earth games. BFME 1, 2, and Rise of the Witch King. Just has everything what you need. And, and even though many, many heroes got changed, Lutz is pretty much the same in all battle for Middle Earth games, guys. Also in BFME 1, he has the chance to fight with Sword or Bow. He has the Carnage, the Cripple, the Leadership, and the Pillage. So he's unchanged in every single version of battle for Middle Earth games. Level 3 already. So leveling up until level 3, 4 is quite easy. But then you need to get level 5. For the leadership to be unlocked. Should be easy because you are faster than tower guards. You can run them down. In the worst case scenario, you can just use the carnage. For 100% damage boost and 20% armor boost. Which is going to not only make you hit like a truck. But you will also be tankier. Work riders are on the hunt. Looks like Isengard player is trying to go for the 10. After the vision of Palantir. I believe that's going to unlock the industry. If I'm not mistaken. I might be wrong though. You might also go for the Whiteman of Dunland Summon or something. I don't know. I don't know the spell books yet from the from BFME 2, which are of course way different in compared to Rise of the Witch King. 550 for Isengard, 600 now, 500 for the Man of the West player. So it's pretty even back and forth game. Lords is on the hunt, you see that? Chasing down those soldiers to death. Carnage can be used in this kind of situations to kill them even a bit faster. But looks like he doesn't want to waste that. He has also the House of Healing around the Fortress. You see this blue animation? This is able to heal the surrounding allied units around the Fortress over time. Which is... I like that. Because the main weakness of the evil factions were always the lack of sustain. In, in BFMA 2, you have sustain. You have even heal from the spellbook. Just like the good factions, you know? Pretty good. 12 power points collected. What is he aiming for? Shark could be also a great choice, actually, when I think about that. Because then you could just chase down the Rohirrim all the time, you know? Whiteman of Dunlane is going to be his choice indeed. On the other side, we have 5, almost 6 power points collected after the Human Wood and the Rallying Call. No heroes from Man of the West just yet. Theodine could be actually a nice choice, you know? But Theodine, unlike in Rise of the Witch King, doesn't give you leadership with level 1. He has Boromir, never mind. He has Boromir, even knocking down Lord on the ground. He's saying this is not... We are not in the films. This is battle for Middle Earth. And here I'm able to knock you down. Boromir needs to be level 5 though. For the damage leadership to be unlocked. So Boromir and Lourdes are pretty similar in terms of damage leadership. You know, they give you the same... Look at that. Boromir! The revenge, ladies and gentlemen, for Gondor! Nice! Boromir was able to slay... I mean, 
he didn't get to kill because soldiers were able to kill him but it's okay he was knocking lords down on the ground all the time and lords couldn't move eight power points collected rohirim almost level two level three is needed for the horn of gonzo which is gonna be a stun for the nearby enemy unit but he's of course surrounded look at that pikes are on this side Isengard army moving from the bottom side and he is not able to put any counter pressure just yet not working i don't know why i was not changing anything maybe i need to restart my uh, obs or something but he doesn't go for the rangers uh, because he has no money pretty much he has to get units on the field because he keeps losing them all the time and going for a third building is just gonna cost you time and also lots of money which he can't afford right now rohirim are running for their lives nice beat and uh, you always use hold ground stands when you use hold ground stands they want to any shenanigans by themselves you know they won't attack or anything you will buy elven warriors yeah potentially but they are also very expensive they cost 400 each and he has not the money yet as you can see at the bottom left side of your screen 10 power points collected now by the man of the west player parami and boromi the captains of gondo side by side where is boromir at? did he lose boromir actually um, no, he was using the Horn of Gonzo here. Tom Bombadil, boom, son, on your face. That's what I like to see. Tom Bombadil also gives you leadership, by the way. That's the armor inspiring leadership, which is also able to stack with the leadership from Boromir, for example, if he ever gets level 5. That's the Bombo combo, ladies and gentlemen. Horn of Gondo to stun them, and then boom, with the Sonic Song, you can knock them on the ground. The furnace has been taken down. Great counter attack. It's, you know, Tom Bombadil is just chasing down the enemy units. And that's what you always gonna see. It, at every stage of the game, I've never seen people trying to actually fight against Tom Bombadil. Every time he's being summoned, the enemy player is always disengaging and running for their lives. Parami and Boromir side by side. Parami using, is using his sword to finally show his quality by taking down the furnace, slowly but surely. Unlike his brother, however, he needs to be level 6 and not level 5. To unlock or level 7 rather sorry level 7 is needed for an armor buff which is pretty much the same buff you get from the elven wood or human wood um remember you cannot have two times the same buff active at the same time just like in the films deja vu but boromir is kind of tough lord's hitting like a truck and boromir is saying no 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 sir you are getting knocked down on the ground and boromir now the captain of conde is running for his life he's not gonna die today trust me on that one cripple could be used by the way i don't know if he was actually using it in the first place i think he did but boromir with the heal of course from the spellbook of gonza was able to survive and now man of the west players units everywhere he has tower guards more of them rohirrim gondo knights he has everything that you need but you know what would be also nice eomir or theorin you know like a mounted hero that can sport the rohirrim and also the gondo knights with additional damage and or armor leadership so Sharku is finally recruited from Archangel. Is this going to be a great hero against the Gondonite slash Rohirrim? Big clash. One of Gondo is coming in clutch, of course. Devastation has been used, by the way, from Isengard. If you're wondering, Devastation here in Bifimi 2 is able to stun them for a short duration. But also that includes the heroes. It means you can, in you know, indeed stun the enemy hero also for multiple seconds. Which can be nice in some situations, to be honest. Oh, but Boromi is almost level 5. Almost. Oh, the furnace has been taken down though. Warc riders were not able to defend this. There is a farm coming up next to the furnace. Sharku is actually fighting. Uh, Starian, thanks for the follow. Appreciate that. Hope you're going to enjoy your stay. Welcome to the stream, my dudes. Berserker is on the field. Level 1. Farami, Boromi, just like... Look at that. Brothers, you know what I'm saying? The blood is thicker than water. Almost level 5. 725 for Isengard and 675 for Man of the West. This might be one of the games in which we potentially get the chance to see like late game stuff, you know? Like a 25 power point, for example, from either Isengard or Gondor or both. I would love to see that. Like Earthquake or Army of the Dead from, Isengard, from Gondor or, of course, the Summon Dragon slash Dragon Strike from the Isengard player. Isengard is just having a good time now with Lourdes being level 5. And Lourdes, of course, guys, is an anti-hero. Inumara, welcome. Lourdes is an anti-hero. That means he can just cripple down either Boromir or Faramir. And, you know, when you have, like, a huge army around, you can also kill them in no time. The Builder, 
He's barely getting in safety by building a wall up, which is extremely tanky. Super hard to be taken down. Faramir needs to be level 7. And then the fact is, unlike in Rise of the Witch King, when this guy is level 7, his leadership is able to stack with the leadership from Boromir. So, and also you can get Kyrian on the field. You can actually stack many, many multiple different leaderships in BFME too. So you need to make a great choice at the beginning of the game to invest your time and money into heroes which can pay off big time in the late game, you know? And we are reaching the point almost very soon. Faramir needs only less than a level to unlock his armor buff leadership. The furnace is going to be protected for now. We have 5, 575 command points for Isengard. Look his money, but his command points kept as we are talking. He is not able to recruit any more units right now, no heroes including. On the other side, Man of the West player has 775 command points. He has not the trouble. But the farm level 3 is going to be taken down. Remember, in BFME 2, Man of the West player has no reveal from the spellbook. And losing a level 3 farm always hurts you. Because that's going to make you lose 100 command points. On top of that, with the pillage, the White Man of the are able to steal money every time they attack you. And Isengard, once he has a bit more command points available, I'm assuming, yeah, Saruman is on his way. So Saruman is going to join the party very, very soon. It means the only missing hero from Isengard in the game number one is going to be... Hold on a second. Wormtongue. Cripple has been used, but Boromir is uh, lured to surround it. Human Wood? What is going on? Does he have heal from the spellbook? Ready? No, it's on cooldown. Faramir? Faramir couldn't show his quality one more time. Cloudbreak is a little bit too late. Cloudbreak is going to be used now, but... Do you have the army you need? Tom Bombadil is still on cooldown. Remember, the second Cloudbreak goes off, you can use Horn of Gondor to stun them one more time. Besides, besides stunning them, heals and revives allied units during 15 seconds. And also stuns them for 10 seconds. In permanent stun, by the way. You see that? Cloudbreak. Cloudbreak goes off. Use Horn of Gondor to stun them again. Permanently crowd control from Boromir. But he's surrounded. So you don't want to be in a spot like that. Trust me on that one, Boromir. The Gondor soldiers, though, they have now the damage leadership from Boromir. And also armor buff from the human wood. Oh, look at this. The lightning bolt. When you hear that, you already know what's happening. Saruman is on the field. And once he's level... No, I mean, no. When he's actually around only, allies near Saruman gain 25% armor, which means it's able to stack with the leadership from Lourdes. And 25% increased combat experience. Armor inspiring. Just like a passive thing. I fight to the end. Oh, Boromir. Now, Boromir has been taken down, but he was able to kill Lourdes before that. Look at this. Lourdes and, Sa Lourdes and Boromir side by side. Ectilion? More like that Lilion. You know what I'm saying? He just left randomly without saying a single word. But I believe in an open field, if the Uruk's Uruk army would fight any Rohan army or Gondor army in open field, they would destroy them. The Urukan, you know what I'm saying? The only reason why they were actually able to win or defend the Helm's Deep is just because... Uh, see it. And I'm also updating the scoreboard, you know? Just because of the deeping wall in the defense, you know, with Elven warriors coming for the reinforcements in the films, and also the Rohirrim arriving to save the Helm's Deep in the last possible minute. And all of that, even though plenty or thousands of Uruks died trying to get to the wall. Imagine on an open field. Furnace, 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 Uruk Pit coming up from Ectilion. On the other side, the Moro player is also building four slaughterhouses at the beginning of the game. So, opening of resource buildings, four of them, to get the money coming in clutch. Uruk Pits into the mighty Urukai, I'm assuming, against Mordor. And I think it's the case in all Battle for Middle Earth games. You want to you wanna make something happen in the early game, you know? You want to put them behind. Now, this matchup, for example, Isengard against Mordor is kind of broken in Battle for Middle Earth 1, in which Isengard has no chance against Mordor. Like, in on Forts of Isen, if you play Isengard against Mordor and the players are equally skilled, there is no way the Mordor player can lose that one, because it's such a favorable matchup for the Mordor faction, you know what I'm saying? But of course, that's not Battle for Middle Earth 1, and here the things are a bit different. So we have Urukai being recruited now from the Uruk Pit into the second Uruk Pit right after. That's okay, because again, unlike in Rise of the Witch King, the Uruks here are a bit cheaper. So that makes them more affordable. We have a Tavern into the second Tavern coming out. Taverns have a passive. When you have two of them, your Corsair is going to be 10% cheaper. And they're also quite expensive units, by the way. They cost normally, every single one of them costs 400. But with two of them, you will reduce the cost to 360. 
if you build the third one, you will be getting them 15% cheaper and four 20% cheaper. Vision of Palantir has been used from Isengard. And uh, Mordor not picking anything from the spellbook just yet. So no Palantir, no, of course not Palantir. No Eye of Sauron, no Warchant or no Tainted Land. Five power points still collected from the beginning of the game. More Urukai. Now he's gonna spam Urukai now. Because he was able to see the tavern, right? He's not worried about the Nazgul rush. Because he was building two taverns. So there is no need of getting any pikemen anytime soon, I'm assuming. And also because these units are very strong against pikemen. That's the reason why. So pikemen would be like a bad choice from Isengard. Alright, he was able to get to the slaughterhouse. Slaughterhouse is getting demolished in time. They are also a bit tankier in compared to the furnaces, by the way. Eye of Sauron will be his choice. And shield ball formation plus the whole crown stands from the Uruks. Are they going to be strong enough? Because Eye of Sauron in BFME 2 is a high tier leadership, which makes the enemy, uh, not the enemy, they will be kind of broken. The allied units deal 25% more damage, become 25% tankier, and also level up 50% faster. But they are still not able to fight against the Urukai, because Gimli was right, like always, you know, this is no rebel of mindless Oryx, my dear Corsairs. These are Urukai. Their armor is thick and their shields broad. Look at the Uruks, man, that's crazy how strong they are. And also keep in mind that these units are even more expensive, you know what I'm saying? I'm not a huge fan of these Corsairs, to be honest with you. I feel like they are quite expensive, they cost 400 each from one single tavern. You need to build the second one to recruit them still for 360 each. You know what I'm saying? Oh, he's losing everything now, right? Yeah, he's down to 200 command points only. Remember, that's the command point you start the game with. Like, he has nothing on the field now. He has no money too. Saruman! Look to Uruks, guys. They are so tanky. They were also able to deal great amount of damage to the Nazgul. When he's level 2, it's going to be a bit easier because it's going to unlock the Dread Visage, which is a passive debuff for the surrounding enemy units to make them lose 25% armor and damage. One single Slaughterhouse, if he loses that, it's going to be pretty much GG. And during all this time, Isengard is creeping. He's untouched. His eco is great, you know? Yeah, I mean... You could see, even with the high tier leadership from Eye of Sauron, the Corsairs, they still couldn't stand a chance against the mighty Uruks. Money secured, creep secured. We have now Pikeman as a counter unit to the Nazgul, of course. There is a Furnace hiding. Might be taken down eventually. Again, Furnace is extremely squishy. Is Ecterion paying attention, though? He is paying attention indeed. We'll get in safety with the Builder. And yeah, 350 command points now for Mordor only. I is almost back up. Isengard is making a move. He has almost the power points he needs for the Warchant. So Warchant can be used for the big push. We have also the first hero. That's again Lourdes, just like in the previous game. In which the matchup was Man of the West against Isengard. Alright, Palantir has been used for movement speed. 15% more movement speed, keep in mind. That's pretty significant. Commitment against the Tavern. Look at the burst damage. The pikes are hitting like a truck, boys. Holy moly. This has been demolished. This is going to be also taken down. Nazgul is getting dismounted to be a bit more tanky against it. Against the pikemen, I see you. But you will not see much anymore as this is going down. May Shadow Facts with the rate of 40. Thank you so much, May Shadow Facts. Appreciate that. Hope you're going to enjoy your stays, guys. Welcome to the stream. We are casting some, game, some games between the two expert players in Battle for Middle Earth 2, Exilion and Archangel. That's the game number two between Isengard and Mordor. The first game was between Isengard and Man of the West. It's a phenomenal game. Hey, Fallen Roach, welcome. Hakan, welcome. Welcome, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Mission of X, welcome. Alright, beautiful. Nazgul already level four, but Mordor is in a, in a really bad spot, guys. Mordor is really in a bad spot. Hey, Raph, welcome. Join us to your best. Uh, Lourdes level 2 has carnage. Level 4 is going to be dangerous for the Nazgul. Because then he won't be able to move. And there is no world in which Nazgul is going to be able to fight against Lourdes. In a one-on-one. -on -one. It's looking really bad for Mordor, yes. Almost 7 power points. 7 power points now for Isengard. And Mordor has 400 command points only. 6 power points collected though. 
And going for a counter-attack in the furnace level 2, he's going to be taken down. That's not bad for Mordo because that's going to make Isengard lose now. Actually, boys, what's going on? Isengard is now all of a sudden less command points than the Mordo player. Come on now. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, level 4 Lourdes. What did he kill? I mean, again, leveling up the heroes in BFME 2 until level 4 is quite easy. Like, I'm telling you that much. Like, when you creep one single Vork layer with a hero level 1, there is a high chance that the hero is going to be level 4 after this one. You know, one single Vork layer. 350 for Mordor. 400 for Isengard. He has 9 power points almost collected. 10 is going to unlock the uh, Valkman of Dunland summon, which can be used for, of course, a big commitment against the Mordor Fortress eventually. Tavern, yes. Tavern for the Corsairs of Umbar. We have not the Umbar map, Palindru, but we have the Corsairs for you, my friends. Ixelion keeps losing stuff, yeah. Nine power points collected now. He was able to creep this offensively at the top right side. And Nazgul is doing a great job. Remember, the Nazgul is such an efficient hero. Very, very cheap. And also, with level 2, the Dread Visage is just amazing. Remember, the debuffs in BFME 2 have much more impact than the debuffs in Rise of the Witch King, you know? Because they are also able to nullify the buff from, for example, the War Chan. Indeed, Batman of Thailand is going to be unlocked. And Lourdes is all about to hit level 5. I hope Sauron has been used on the Corsairs. And on top of that, the Nazgul is able to debuff them. Corsairs are a great counter to the Pikemen, by the way. Keep that in mind. This is best of 3. No, that's like show matches. I don't know how many games they want to play. Uh, almost level 5, Nazgul. Lourdes on the other side is also really close to level 5. Wildman of Dunland getting into, into the range of the fortress. Trample is incoming. Look, cripple him. Just cripple him, I guess. That's all you gotta do. Is he going for it? Yeah, he's going for it, guys. Never move now for 30 seconds. And the pipemen are coming in clutch now. Watch this. Oh my goodness. Actually, the pikes are goners. And he might be able to save the Nazgul. He might be able to save the Nazgul, yeah. Great defense. The Nazgul is going to get in safety, but Lourdes might be in trouble now. Uh, but is he fast enough to disengage from the... He's going to turn around and use Carnage. Get experience like crazy. Level 5 is going to be unlocked now, but is he going to die? Move, 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 move. But Lourdes is not here to run away. He's here to fight. Nazgul is his... Boom! Nazgul is showing his quality. Almost level 6. Any for, the, any for Gondor spammers here? It was not working. <laughs> Barindur was trying, but it was not working, my friends. 5 power points collected. 500 command points available for Mordor. In, uh, for Isengard, sorry. 450 command points and 11 power points collected for Mordor. The Lourdes has been taken down. That hurts. It hurts. This can actually turn the game around again. He's gonna go for now. Uh, he's gonna choose the Tainted Lands, which again is able to stack with the Eye of Sauron. And also Warchand is able to stack with the Eye of Sauron in Tainted Lands. So the, the way this works, by the way, Warshan is like a damage leadership. Armor from the Tainted Land and High Tier from Eye. So all the 5 power points from the Mortal Faction Spellbook are able to stack with each other. For like the maximum value of the attack, defense and combat experience leadership bonuses. Almost 7 power points collected, 500 command points available. The Nazgul was the MVP for sure. Just gotta be careful because he's extremely squishy. So a couple of seconds against Pikeman and he's gonna be gone, you know? Lourdes has to be revived as soon as possible. Oh my goodness, man. What a turnaround. It was looking so bad for Archangel at the beginning of the game. Like he was down to 200 command points only, guys. That's crazy. He had like 300, 300 resources and 200 command points only. And from an extremely aggressive early game stage, Isengard now is forced to play extremely defensively. Berserker, Pikeman. And he's just camping, you know, you see that? Kribin is going to be finally chosen. It's going to be used now on the Corsairs, but Corsairs are just disengaging. Lourdes has to be recruited. There is a level 5 Corsair, by the way. Level 5. Remember... In this game, you are able to level up to level 10. Warp Pit is finally coming up. Finally. 
Painted Land plus the Eye of Sauron. That's what I'm talking about. Look, I'm now hitting like a truck. Oh my goodness. What a, what a fiesta. What a massacre, boys. What is going on? The Warped is coming up for Isengard, but it's gonna be just too late. He's falling apart. He's losing left and right. The Furnace falling down right after. This one is going down as well. Corsairs are just actually quite efficient, to be honest. I like them. What is happening on the other side? Mordor is now all of a sudden having 650 command points. The Nazgul is nearly level 6. Level 6 is going to unlock the Morgul Blade. Looks like you want to creep the trolley at the bottom left side. That's what you want to do, you know. You want to always... Multitasking is the key to victory in RTS games. You got to be fast. And also, once again, guys, I was talking about that at the beginning of this stream. Tomorrow, uh, like in less than 24 hours from now, there is going to be the release date, uh, the release of Age of Empires 4. And you're going to play that tomorrow on stream. And tomorrow also, I'm going to give away two of these Age of Empire 4s in the Digital Deluxe Edition for you guys. Uh, and you will get them for free with the Steam key. You, all you got to do is put the Steam key on your Steam account and boom, you will be able to download the game, which normally costs you 80 bucks. You will get them for, for free tomorrow. Because then we can potentially play together. All right. Almost level 3. Berserk actually quite quite strong. Hitting very hard. No Orc Pit, I see. Yeah, no Orc Pit. I mean, there is a... Like, you can, of course, build the Orc Pit. Just like in Rise of the Witch King 2. But um, many people are choosing to go with the Taverns. You know what I'm saying? For me, I want Age of Empires 4. Yeah, there is a chance you get the game. I hope you, I hope you will win, man. But of course, it's randomized. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna... Put all the names in like the bot is gonna decide. The night bot is gonna decide that. Eleven power points collected. Isengard is going for a counter attack, but during all this time, Corsairs and also Easterlings are destroying some furnaces from Isengard. Now he has to make something happen. Does he have devastation? Yeah, he has devastation now, which means money, money, money. Or you can stun the enemy units with that, including the heroes. Lourdes is level 6, by the way. Level 7 is going to unlock the pillage, which means even more money for Isengard. So long story short, Isengard is the faction with the best eco in, you know, in the mid to lead game. With Devastation, pillage from Lourdes, and even industry and field of fires, you should never ever run out of money with this beautiful faction of Isengard. I see you. Move the, I have, move the Kribane. Hey, Benzi! How are you doing today, Benzi? Welcome. Nice to see you in the chat. Oh, not even close, baby. The two Easterlings are the MVPs. The counter-attack, though, they are now glowing, shining bright like a diamond. The sound effects are not working for now, for whatever reason. I will try to fix them later on. Big commitment. Tavern is going down like it's nothing. Pikes are also able to deal massive damage to the buildings, by the way, guys, if you don't know. Especially with Lourdes' leadership, which increases their DPS by 50%. Nice surrounding. Level, I see level 6 Urukai. Always to see, always nice to see some high leveled units or heroes. The Nazgul can't do much. He can't approach that. Because the second he approaches, Lourdes can just switch to the bow mod and cripple him down, you know. That's all he gotta do. 500 command points now for Isengard, and Mordor is dropping down to 300. What a back and forth game. It's actually crazy how this game is changing, you know, in like two minutes. Two minutes ago, it was looking fantastic for the Mordor player, and now all of a sudden, he's down a lot. Like, that's what I'm talking about. Because the buildings are so squishy, one counterattack can change the entire outcome of the game. Just like that, you know? Morgul Blade is available now. Use, use it on Lords. Use it on Lords. Use it on Lords. Morgul Blade. Him. Yeah. Okay, they are both crippled now. Lords is level 7 though. Is he gonna die? 
Now, he's not... Look, the positioning of the units. You see that? He's not being able to attack from many, many units at the same time. I believe Lourdes is tanky enough, but he was 440 in the bank. Just because of the pillage, you will get 440 for killing the enemy Nazgul. Dude, that's a lot. That's really effective, to be honest with you. The pillage is coming in clutch. Look, the money rising now. Every time units are dying next to Lourdes... You will get money, money, money. Also, Shark is on the fields now. And Isengard will be able to win this fight. And also, the Nazgul has been taken down. That's like the best case scenario. 10 power points collected after the Whiteman of Dunland summon for Isengard player Ectelion. Archangel on the other side is 400 command points only. And he just lost the Nazgul. He lost a lot of production buildings. He has to now build, rebuild the tower. And for the first time in the game, never mind, he actually cancels the Orc pits. He doesn't want to get Orcs now. It's kind of understandable because I believe it's just a little bit too late for the Orcs. You know what I'm saying? BFME 2, a game where you can level up your heroes to level 5 in 30 seconds. Or, or Rise of the Witch King in which you are able to level up one level, uh, Gandalf to level 10 in 3 hours. I mean, it's about preference, I think. <laughs> I like to see heroes highly leveled, to be honest with you. That's like the entire premise of Battle for Middle-earth games, because in which heroes should be having a lot of impact, you know? Because it's Lord of the Ring related. That makes this RTS game so special, because the heroes we know from the films are also included. And I don't like the fact that you need to invest 3 hours and 50 Visa Plus, 80 Easter Lights and 30 Lightning Swords to get your Gandalf eventually in a 2-hour game in 1 out of 1 million games to level 10. So here it's most likely gonna happen. Corsairs. Industry has been used on the level 2 slaughterhouse, which is a huge boost that's gonna boost the resource income to 300%. 500 command points available for Mordor and 750 for Isengard. Charku, level 3. Yeah, here's the Blood Hunt, which is, of course, a leadership for a nearby allied works. It's a high tier hero leadership, by the way. And with level uh, 6, he unlocks the Man-Eater. And level 9, he will unlock the Team the Beast, which is making him even stronger than he is in Rise of the Witch King. He will be able to steal the enemy cavalry unit. For example, in this matchup, it's kind of useless, though. Because Mordor has no Cav, and you are not able to steal heroes, of course. It's not going to be possible. Uh, but you are able to steal, like, Gondor Knights, Rohirrim, and so on. When will version 3 be released? I don't know. I'm not involved in this patchmaking thing, you know what I'm saying? I think they are still testing it and stuff. Might still take some time, you know? Can you steal Mumakil? I don't think so. Mumakil is not considered as like a cavalry unit. Mumakil is a monster. Mumakil is like the, has the same classification of like a mountain troll or cave troll or attack troll. And not like a cavalry unit, you know what I'm saying? Even though it's like four legs. I don't know. If I don't even know. I've never seen this before. You, you can steal, right? Yeah. Sharku level 4. Mortor is now pushing back. 650 for Mortor and 800 for Isengard. 15 power points collected after the Whiteman of Tanland and Devastation. He has the House of Healing going on. For the sustain around the fortress. The Furnace is going down. Nazgul is back on the field. Level 6 now. As the Morgul bleeds, uh, Sharku might be in trouble. And also, I, I can't see Lourdes. He's building the Armory. Is he going to go for the, for the field of fires? On this map, dudes, there are so many trees around. You can get so much value from the Lamu Mills. In the combination with the field of fires, you will grow rich in no time. The Furnace level 2. Berserker versus the Nazgul. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh, don't. Look, you see how much damage he's taking in like 2 seconds? Oh, Cripple, that is Lords. Didn't even see him. And I believe the motor player was also not able to see him. And the Nazgul, for the second time, 440 resources will be donated to the Isengard player. And fuel the fires for even more money. Look at that. You get 60... What? 65 more resources from the harvesting the tree. So it's a bit less. Lamry Mills gain 20% armor. That's pretty new. And also wards on allies. Like when you are, for example, playing goblins and Isengard in a 2v2 match... And your goblin ally has also Lamry Mills. You can also boost their, uh, you know, Lamry Mills with 65% increased resource income. That's crazy, my dude. That's crazy. Hey, Max Flex, welcome. Shanks, I will be making a WFME mod. I would love to see you play it. It's based on my own book. Uh, your own book? 
I mean, I, of course I can get, I can take a look into that, no problemo. But I believe making a brand new mod is kind of very hard. Unless you want to just make like two, three units and call it a mod. But like when I when I see these mods nowadays, like for example the Eden mod from uh, Rise of the Witch King or the Age of the Ring mod, how detailed this is. Not only the brand new factions, units, heroes, but also the barrage. Mordor is using barrage defensively actually. He's doomed. Look the money from Isengard. Skyrocking, guys. Skyrocking. Uh, does it stack in an Eisen team? I don't think it stacks. I don't think anything stacks. Like, you can't have two darkness, two freezing rain, two field of fires. I don't think it stacks like that. And Mordor is falling into darkness. And you get 1250. 1250 resources for killing the fortress just because of Lourdes' passive from the pillage. That's nuts. That's really nuts. I like that. And the more details, like, uh, the more players are involved, for example, that's why I don't like to play 4v4 games myself. Because even if, like, when you see the, you know, 1v1 or 2v2 matches being so laggy sometimes, imagine a 4v4 match, bro. Imagine you have, like, massive units from every single player, four players on each team, eight players in total from all around the world, trying to con connect with each other. Just imagine that for a single second. How laggy this can become in some situations. Two tunnels, and for the first time ever, we see Goblin 3 from Archangel against the Alvin player, Ictilion. In the game number three, in the first tiebreaker. On the beautiful map, Forts of Brunin. Nice matchup again, yeah. Yeah, the engine delay is, of course, fixable. But again, I mean... Kind of expecting that from people, uh, you know, doing that in their free time is kind of too much. You need to have like a company working on this project. And nobody is interested in Lord of the Ring lore right now because nobody has the rights. And yeah, I mean, just think about Age of Empires 4, guys. Like, I was buying the game three times, by the way, uh, because I wanted a giveaway. Also, like, saying like, thank you to you guys in the chat. Giving you the chance to also win one of the Age of Empires 4s. But imagine that. It's like a brand new game they are making from the scratch. Of course, it's like related to to Age of Empire games, but still. And they are charging you 80 bucks for that. 80 bucks. Which is crazy amount of money for like a video game, right? In my opinion, at least. It's just like a lot. But they are not able to make any more money in the future from you. So basically, you buy the game one time and you have the game forever. And they will, of course, need to give you servers. They will need to give you ladders. So they have investments every single month. They need to always keep investing money into the game to make new patches and stuff like that. They need moderators, they need that, they need this. So it's gonna cost them eventually a lot of money. And that's the problem with RTS games. They have like little to zero ways of making money in long term. You know what I'm saying? Unlike for example Riot Games, which is a mobile game. And you have like skins you can sell, you can make money every single month. It's a free to play game, but you can still make more money from a couple of skins than the <laughs> you know Battle for Middle Earth game made ever. From setting the game you know what i'm saying so no small transactions it's a huge game they need a lot of time to develop such a game and it's just not lucrative enough for the companies you know because what do you think about when you want to make a successful company you want to think about the easiest way and the fastest way of making as much money as you potentially can so focusing on rts games is just not the right call in my opinion Oh my goodness, goblins are everywhere. I'm very good at coding, so the mod won't take that very long. In my opinion, I think the best factions will be Omnar, but don't want to spoil stuff. Yeah, just finish it, send it to me, and we can take a look into that together in the stream. No problemo. I mean, there are so many mods already in BFME games, that's crazy when you think about that, you know? I was just recently taking a look into the, into the mod, uh, the Skyrim mod. Like, come on now, that's crazy, dude. How many mods are there? Mr. Zelinda01 for the primers for the fifth month, my dude. Thank you so much for the huge spot to the channel and welcome back. Means a lot to me. Thank you, thank you. Just resubscribed for five months. Ahoy. Thank you so much. 
Archers are dealing with those Goblin Warriors, no problemo. Spider Pit is now up for the Spider Lynx or the Spider Pit level 2 for the Spider Riders. That's gonna be his choice. Two Goblin Caves, by the way. Uh, nearly 2 power points collected for Archangel. The Goblin play, he's down to 500 command points only. I mean, he's up to 500 command points. While Elves are down to 350. So Elves are like a defensive faction, you know what I'm saying? Like, they used to play... They always, like, in every battle for Middle Earth game, they are, like, getting Archers on the field and playing it kind of slow and passive. Yeah, you can send it me in Discord. No problemo. Oh, look, that's what Archangel does all the time. He wanna creep the trolley with the, with the goblins all alone. You see that? Look at that. He's just gonna sacrifice the goblins, creep the trolley as soon as possible, get the money, and... I've seen this many, many times, by the way. In one of the tournament games, I think it was like two years ago, it was kind of phenomenal to watch that. The trolls were a bit more stronger in the patch. I think it was like 1.09, not the version 2. And then he was luring the troll from the lair to the enemy fortress. And this troll, guys, was able to destroy the fortress all alone. It was crazy to watch that. And he might do the same again. Look at this. Goblins are so fast. They are as fast as the troll. Oh, he's trying to bring the troll to the Malone tree, at least, I'm assuming, right? Break it. Archangel doing it again? Yeah, he's doing it again. Look. Follow me, troll. Rallying code has been used on the archers. He knows what's up. Houtnin, thanks for the follow. Appreciate that. Welcome to the stream, my dude. Beautiful beat and trample into the archers. And look at this troll going mad. Oh my goodness. Using the environment, the map for himself. You know what I'm saying? And look at the damage Archangel is able to put off. Look how much pressure this troll is putting on, on Ectelion. That's crazy, am I right or not, guys? And because he's busy dealing with the troll in like 30 plus seconds... Archangel, in the meantime, is destroying everything. He's destroying Malon trees. He's destroying the well. And look at that. He's demolishing every Ectelion is tilted. Trust me on that one, guys. Ectelion is molding right now. We have the yellow Dwarven player, Archangel, against the blue Mordor player, Ectelion. Back to the future. Oh, that's a very interesting opening from, Arch from Ectelion, though. Haradrim Palace opening. I mean, I've seen a lot. I've seen Tavern, I've seen Orkpit, but not Haradrim Palace yet. In BFME 2 at least. So Slaughterhouse into the Haradrim Palace immediately. On the other side, we see Mineshaft, Mineshaft. And he might build now right after the Hall of Warriors. Or he might also go for the third Mineshaft. Just to get a bit more money, you know? But let's see what he's gonna choose for. Easter Rings. They cost 60 command points and 350. And of course, Dwarves are the only faction uh, in BFME 2 which has no scouting abilities from the spellbook. Yeah, for example, Mordor is like 2, right? You can use Tainted Land or Eye of Sauron. Goblins have also 2, Cave Pets or the Tainted Land. Farsight from Elves, Vision of Palantir from Isengard, Human Wood from uh, Man of the West. And Mo Dwarves have nothing. Wait, let me actually refresh this because the sound commands are not working. Can you give the points back to Invamura, please, Palindro or Kitira? Because he was just wasting 5,000 and didn't get anything for that. I am going to the military for six months. I hope the community will be bigger when I come back. Uh, I'm, I'm wishing you, of course, you know, a great and safe stay in the military, my friends. Hope you will have a great time. It's going to be a great experience for you. And you will grow up. Maybe you can use more than only a troll emoji in the chat when you come back. <laughs> I'm joking, man. I'm just wishing you, of course, the best. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. What is that? Forge Force opening. That's very interesting, too. For the Battle Wagon action. And Mordor is creeping at the same time. With the War Chant. He was using War Chant to creep this. Looks like he want to lead now to the trolley at the bottom right side with the Easter Rings. That's a very interesting opening from the Mordor player. Did you get it back? Yeah, he should be getting it back, I think, the Numiora. Orcs now, coming up next, into the second Orc Pit. So, Orcs for pressuring and Easterlings for creeping. Forgeworks level 2 is incoming for 300. That's gonna make you also, you know, recruit everything 10% faster. And he will be primarily getting some battle wagons on the field first. Back. Welcome back, dude. 
The last game even was a troll fiesta, true death. <laughs> Portworks. Level uh, 2. Battle wagon for 570 command points. Looks like you want to creep the goblin lay behind the base with the guardians. And during all this time, Mordor was securing himself yet another creep. Level 4 unlocked for the Easter eggs, boys. The builder is scouting this area. He might build a potential mineshaft for the harassment. Mordor for now is in a good spot. He's also scouting this area. In this matchup against dwarves, you want to always scout. You want to always check what's going on. You know, what is he building? Is he building more mineshafts? And so on. Very important to see what's going on. Vision is the key to victory. The last thing you want is like a sneaky attack from your behind. And you are not prepared for such a push, you know. Because if the guardians are making it to your buildings, trust me on that one. Your buildings are going to fall in no time. The creep secured, level 2 unlocked for the guardians. They have also charge attack. Which is unlocked with level 2. It's going to give them 25% armor, 25% speed. It's an armor buff. Which means it's able to stack with the rallying call. Big attack is incoming. Orcs and Easterlings. Uh, Battle Wagon is inside the mineshaft, by the way, if you are wondering. Looks like he want to actually go for attack. Or is he going to try to defend himself? He might be forced to defend himself. You don't want to underestimate this army. Vorshan has been used. Big commitment on the Forge Wars. What is this burst damage, dude? It's a level 2 building, too. Well, not anymore level 2. It's going to be level 0 after it's getting destroyed in no time by the Easterlings. Holy quackamole. And that's one of the things, you know, what I don't like very much about PvME 2. That your buildings, even your production buildings like the Forge Works level 2, are made of paper. Like that you can take them down in no time. The Battle Wagon has to be careful now. It's a very expensive unit. You, you don't want to lose them. The mineshaft is also going down. Nice surrounding from Ictilion. Very well done, you know, executed. So losing the Forge Wargs uh, means that he has to now make sure that the battle wagon he has, the only one, has to be surviving for the, for the majority of the game. Because what happens is like you invest 300 for the upgrade of level 2. You build the building with your builder, which costs you time and even more money. And then you lose that in no time. That hurts you a lot. Level 2 is going to unlock the Dread Visage. Orc Arch is now on the field for the defense against Guardians. And Guardians, of course, are the slowest Swordsmen in the entire game. So you can kite them quite easily, you know? Kite them. Or hit and run, hit and run all the time. And look at that. The Age of Dwarves is over, ladies and gentlemen. The Age of the Orc has come. It's a huge Orc army with Easter Rings moving forward. Gloin is on the field as the first hero from Dwarves. I like that. Slap is available. Use it. On the Easterlings. Orcs are getting, of course, one shot yet. No problemo. Battle Wagon is quite low. Gotta be careful. There are some Easterlings you need to avoid fighting. Tainted Line will be summoned for the armor buff. 35% increased armor now for the units from Mortal Player Ictilion. Let's see how much damage he will be able to deal. Boom, boom, boom. Let's go inside the jeans, boys. Mineshaft is getting bursted down in no time. It's going down, down, down. He might even be able to destroy the Hall of Warriors in no time. Destroy it! Take down the Hall of Warriors now. Rallying Call is going to be used defensively. That's the last thing you want, actually. You know, you, want, you don't want to use anything defensively like that. I don't like that. Uh, two Shanks, Pikes OP versus enemy buildings. Yeah, I mean, I can understand that your resource buildings are kind of squishy against Pikes, but it was a level 2 Force Works, you know? I didn't see that coming. The burst damage was kind, was kind of crazy. Like, there is no counterplay to that. If they ever gonna make it to your buildings, you're gonna lose them. Slaughterhouse is gonna be safe for now. Great defense from Mortar. Or? Banner? Oh my goodness. Not even close, baby. This has to stop, man. That's so... That happens so many times. It's not a co coincidence anymore. The, the amount of times I've seen buildings with zero HP. Look at that. It's actually kind of crazy. Dude, you don't even see a health bar anymore, right? Look at this. It's burning. Level 2 Nazgul. Mordor is doing, an, uh, doing a great job since the beginning of the game. 
He has 650 command points collected after the war chant in Tainted Land. In Dwarves, they are also at 650 command points, but he has to, of course, uh, you know, be careful with the, with the Glein. And then he has to recruit more units. Maybe, you know, again, King Brand does not exist in this game, guys. So King Brand is no-no. You have, of course, only three heroes. You have the Dwarven heroes, King Dane, Glein, and Gimli. That's it. Minus 10 HP, yeah. Big commitment. Oh, the slap shot. The slap attack. The Haradrim Impetus is going down. Big commitment on the Orc Pit. Mishiro, did you play uh, Age of Mishiro just today? Oh, the Shake Foundation. What is, what is this Fiesta? Hobbit Summon, what is this Fiesta? Run, Gloin. You have no heal. Oh, the Shire music. You'd like to hear that. Throw the wagons with the feel of Galadriel. Causes enemy units to flee. Firewalls. What is this shenanigan? What is going on? What is burning? Why? <laughs> What's happening? I'm wounded. I'm wounded. Very green took. Um, Kyojin, uh, I don't know, man. I really don't know. Like, Discord is something else. You know what I'm saying? It happens to me also. Just ask, for example, Balindru. When I'm trying to stream anything in Discord, my Discord streams are extremely laggy. I have no clue why. My PC is good enough, and also I have also good connection. But always my friends are telling me, yeah, your stream is pixelated. We can't see anything. It's just lagging and stuff like that. I don't know. I have no clue. I think you need to kind of Google that. Google the question, you know? Ask Google. I have no clue. I could help you about, about OBS and stuff like that, about the streaming service for Twitch and YouTube, but Discord stream is something, it's like our own science, you know what I'm saying? Hey, Gloin! Oof! Go, 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 Gloin! Make your son proud! Oh, Gloin the Nazgul Slayer! Gloin is the Nazgul Slayer, boys. Oh, he's going down, though, level 7. Mouth of Sauron, level 4. Doubt is unlocked. And also the evil eye is unlocked with level 3. Doubt is like an active debuff. Which is on top of, you know, doing the same like in Dread Visage. Also making the enemy units even move slower. And imagine that you are using that on the dwarven units. Because they are already slow. And you make them even slower this way. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of crazy. Think the line will be used defensively. But, you know, dwarves have now the momentum. They keep pressuring all the time. Mouth of Sauron is getting dismounted. Can and should be used in Doubt, by the way. Will be now used to make them weaker. Archers, I mean, Guardians are just to take, you know? They are very strong. Uh, even with Nitro, yeah, Discord Nitro is also kind of a joke, guys. I mean, you don't get anything for that. It's so expensive, too. Like, when you think about that, the investment of the money, you know what I'm saying? Like, nowadays you can buy many, 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 many stuff for, like, monthly prices. Like, for example, Netflix or Amazon Prime or um, YouTube Premium. For me, the best investment was definitely uh, Netflix and also Amazon Prime. These two are just the king, you know? Everything else, I have also YouTube Premium, but you don't get any value from that, you know? Not nearly as much value than you get from Amazon Prime or Netflix. And Discord Nitro is also just like that, you know? You get like, what, two boosts on a, on a server for like a crazy amount of money a year, just not worth it. Guardians and Pikemen. Yeah, about last year, about last year to boost our server to level 2, which, you know, which was needed, because in our server, as you guys know, we are sharing stuff. Like, for example, game files to, for the installation, like in the technical support channel, to make, uh, to help the people out when they have, like, problems with the installation. We need to share size, and when you have no Discord, uh, so we're level 2, or when you have known Discord Nitro, you are not allowed to share size, uh, big size, big size uh, images and files, you know what I'm saying? And I was forced to, to pay for that, just so I can upload many, many stuff to the, uh, to the Discord channel, so people can download it easily and fix the problem. And it was just very expensive and was not valuable at all. It was a waste of money, long story short. 
Someone know? Yes. Uh, September, 2nd September. Uh, se September 22. September 22 in 2022. Evil Eye has been used. And also, when I was using the Discord Nitro, my stream was still lagging. I have no clue why Discord is lagging. So late, yeah. We were expecting it to be released this year, but unfortunately, they decided to release next year. Are you going back to Rise of the Witch King anytime soon, mate? Uh, not anytime soon. Maybe next year. Maybe 2022. I'm gonna stream tomorrow Age of Empires, dude. I'm looking forward for that. I'm actually looking forward for this game now for a really long time. Hopefully, it's not going to be a disappointment. Hopefully, it's not going to be like a new design of, a, of Age of Empires, you know? Hopefully, it's going to be much more complex than that. Hopefully, it's going to be a great game I can actually commit on, you know? Most of the time when I buy a game, I'm always disappointed. Maybe my expectations are a bit too high. But every time in the past five years when I was buying a game, I was always disappointed. Make a tournament for BFME1. BFME1 has not enough players to make a tournament for. BFME1 is in a, in a bad spot since years, unfortunately. I wish that would, be not, that would not be the case. When I first started this channel, Bolivar, like in 2018, I was mainly and almost exclusively streaming Battle for Middle Earth 1 on this channel. Almost every single day, dude. I was streaming like 4-5 hours every single day. Commentary, by the way. I, there was so much going on, like quick match games, Tournaments, competitive games, fun games. When I was playing myself, free for alls, 3v3s, 4v4s, so much action. It was enough content to stream every single day and to make brand new videos for YouTube also every single day. But then, uh, some people decided to make a patch uh, for BFME 1, which kind of divided the community into two pieces. So many, many people left the game and all of the competi competition scene kind of got killed. It's still there, you know, some of people are still playing that, but it's just not, it's like five people playing against each other all the time, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of sad. I like the game also, you know, I like the game a lot. BFME 1 is always going to be my favorite game, childhood game. I used to play when I was 12, 13 years old every single day. After the school, I have like amazing memories, guys. Every time I came from the school home... Before making my homework, I was always sitting at my PC and playing BFME 1 games, quick match games, on the on the ladder every single day. My childhood was like that. I'm, I was a nerd, I have to admit. I'm sorry, but BFME 1 is boring. I mean, again, you know, it's, it's, it's our preference, of course. Some people like BFME 1, some people like BFME 2, some people like Rise of the Witch King, some people like Fortnite. But 2v2s in BFME 1 were actually quite interesting, you know, 2v2 matches. When you have like a... I mean, uh, there is something about BFME 1 which also, I think, is kind of kind of bad. And uh, the bad thing about BFME 1, and that's my opinion, is like the 20, like the ultimate power point. Like the Balrog or the Army of the Dead. Because they are game-breaking, you know what I'm saying? Oh, the Barrage on your face, man! From the Mordor player, by the way, guys. For the defense, Cloudbreak has been used, but he was not able to kill too much. Uh, like the Balrog summon or the Army of the Dead summon, that the fact that Balrog is able to one-shot the entire base of Gondor or Rohan all alone is just making the lead game not very interesting. Gimli, the Mouth of Sauron against Gimli, heal has been used, fireworks, Evil Eye is on cooldown, Gimli is turning around and slapping now Mouth of Sauron, and he's now forced to disengage. Gimli is tanky, we have also King Dane on the field, like all the heroes from Dwarves, where is Glonad? Glonad, I believe, got killed. Dane with level 5. Uh, actually, no. With level 7. He has to stab on pride. Didn't know that. Uh, for the for the, for the fear resistant. You know what I'm saying? And with the mighty rage, you are able to either make your own unit stronger or the enemy units weaker. Edain mod is so cool. Edain mod is kind of kind of too crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's too, too slow for me. It, it's I don't know why, but it just feels extremely slow for me. You know? Like, when I want to buy upgrades, for example, from a building, I want to not wait like 10 minutes for the upgrade to be up purchased. You know what I'm saying? That was my biggest problem with Edain mod. Like you invest money and then you need to just wait 3 minutes because it's loading so extremely slow. You know what I'm saying? I didn't like that. I gotta ask, could it be that you are a German? 
I'm living in Germany indeed, my friends. But I'm not German. I'm Turkish guy. But I'm living in Germany now for like 20 years. So yeah. You potentially hear the German accent out, out of me. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> so let's see if it's about the matchup or about the players. We have the blue Dwarven player Ecterion at the bottom side against the yellow model player Archangel at the top side. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the beautiful map Plains of Linden. Trolley at the bottom right, protecting the inn. The same also around, around the top left side. Yeah, and the humans with their blue lightsaber. Yeah, I, I don't care about that, to be honest. You know what I'm saying? I don't care. Like, they are always sharing some pictures in the in the Reforge announcement. They are taking everybody and saying, yeah, guys, look at that. We have King Dean, you know? Then you look at King Dean. Yeah, it looks great, but that's not what I'm waiting for. You know what I'm saying? I want to see a gameplay video. I want to see... I want to I want to I want to see the actual game, you know. I don't want to see the lumber mill worker from the Isengard faction. I will not pay attention about that for more than 2 seconds, trust me on that one. For me it's about you know the game's flow. How fast can I play? What units I'm able to recruit and not about how the units are looking like. I mean, some people care about that. The casual players care about that. But at the end of the day, it's about the active players who are going to play this game actively in multiplayer scene and trust me i think the majority of the people at least won't care about that two mineshafts hall of warriors into the guardians the third mineshaft has been built offensively next to the troll uh, work layer. so it looks like he doesn't want to go for a creep he want to go actually for an attack early on mordor in the meantime is building up an orc pit into the second orc pit right after like for example benzi i know benzi cares about that benzi wants to have beautiful looking great looking units and it's about preference, it's okay. Guardians. Um, and also about Reforged. Again, I can understand, it's a fan-made project. And that's very important to keep in mind. That they are working on the project in their free time. It's not like they are getting paid for that or something like that, you know what I'm saying? And that can still take a long time. But I believe, and that's my opinion, when you make a project, when you start a project, you need to make, you need to prioritize something, you know what I'm saying? You need to ask your, or tell yourself, that's our priority, that's our priority. That's what I, we are aiming for, that's what we should be doing first, you know? That's what I'm trying to say. And when you create a game, shouldn't be about the hairs of the Lorian warriors. This should not be your priority, you know what I'm saying? Your priority should be making the faction ready, so the gameplay is kind of working already. Then you can always design later on. But make a playable game. Then you can make like a new patch. In which you improve the design of the units. But making the actual game run. And then, you know, just like the HD patch for example for BFME 2. Like, the, the BFME 2 was existing for a long time. And then some, some guys actually made like a HD patch. Then you download the patch and boom, you have like a HD edition of the game. You know? That's what I'm trying to say. You can always make the graphical improvements in the later stages after the game is kind of playable. Yeah, it's... Yeah, I know, I know. Of course, the fact that they are working on a project like that is, of course, honorable. You know, it's beautiful. And there is no question about that. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, uh, I'm becoming impatient slowly but surely. <laughs> I, want, I want to play this game now. I've been waiting now for three years, though, dude. I think the first announcement has been over three years now. Over three years. Okay, uh, he has to protect his mineshaft, by the way. What bonus does he get from the statues? Armor. Uh, buff. 35% armor and fear resistant. And also increased command points by 10. So it's pretty nice. Especially on Guardians, because they are so tanky. And you can make them even tankier. Look how long they take actually to kill them with the archers and Eye of Sauron on top of that. Offensive archer range, I like that. Bi alaikum salam, Eldar. Hey, uh, Treshko, welcome. This is a Polish name, Stresko, Stresko. Because I believe in the Polish language, they are not look using the vocals. You know what I'm saying? There is not much of. A I E O, you know, this is not being used. Like many, many non vocals are being used. 
The Nazgul, though, is gonna mess up big time. There is no pikemen. But he has the mineshaft next to this area. Just recruit the pikemen now. He's command points kept. No, he's not command points kept. He's also the Sustain over time, you know. He's healing up all the time. I'm also half creation, so I feel you beyond. <laughs> Uh, I know a, a really a really good friend of mine is actually also creation. I'm with him. I'm you know with him in the voice chat every single day, and every time when I'm talking to him, it's like yebote yebote, ide ide yebote. Ayoy. <laughs> what is he else saying? Like uh, what else was he was, was he always saying? Ubiga ubiga. Da. I don't know what this is supposed to mean by the way, but. He's always saying like when he when something bad happens, he's like always, ah yo. <laughs> and I'm so under influence of that, you know. I'm also using it in my real life. Every time when something bad happens, to my, you know, I'm always like to my wife, ah yo, and she's like, what the heck is this supposed to mean? I don't know. It just sounds cool, I guess. Heal for the uh, well for the sustain statue for the armor buff, and he was able to protect himself around this side. I'm not gonna tell you what that means. <laughs> okay. Ujivo. Like, he's always telling me, Shanks, are you Ujivo? I think that's supposed to be, mean, like, are you live? Are you streaming right now or something? Ujivo. Bieji. Stai. Bieji, stai. I think this is also a kind of creation, right? Stai. Two Nazgûls. Double trouble. Hey, Andy Brandy, welcome. And also Temtito, welcome. Beautiful trample. Almost level 2 Nazgul. And the other one is almost level 4. So the debuff is activated. And we have also Glon on the field. You will see now the amount of experience you will be able to get from killing this. I'm from Hungary, but so it's not Polish name. Okay, sorry for that. I was just wondering because I have many, many Polish friends in Germany too. And uh, they are always having these names without vocals. You know what I'm saying? Like, or something like that. It's always so funny, you know? They are always awesome. I mean, I'm not, no offense, by the way. I like them. I like them. They are the most coolest guy I've ever met in my life. Extrovers. Creeping slowly but surely. Oh, the builder is surrounded. Orcs are like, looks like meat's back on the menu, boys. What is the builder doing? He's lost. They are not to be eaten. They are legs. They don't need them. I see you. I see you. Oh, no more. Yeah, whatever I do for you, my friends. Sauron. Sauron is also in the chat. Sauron is the best PFM2 player. I, I heard. But Sauron, uh, I see him playing today 1.00 patch. I don't know why. The, you know, move with the, with, the, with the dude. Level 4, Shake Foundation is available. We have right now 600 for Mordor and 664 Dwarves. But Mordor have the, have the momentum, you know? Okay. Manchir is going down, but it's okay. I believe Dwarves can defend this one. That is, by the way, Klein moving on. Let's see how much damage he will be able to deal. With the Shake Foundation, he can hit like a truck, by the way, if you don't... I mean, you will see. Like, he can one-shot everything. But he doesn't need to use that. Look, he's slapping also with the normal auto attacks against a level 2 Slaughterhouse. Like, it's nothing, my dude. Saron is the best? Are you kidding me? I mean, you prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Challenge him right now. And win against him right now. Again, everybody who disagrees with me might will get the chance to prove me wrong. Oh, Hobbit Summon for the second time. Gloin's hammer should be called truck. Yeah. Spec. I don't know who you to spec. I mean this. I mean, I gotta be honest, the BFME 2 guys, they have like weird, weird war choices, you know? 
Oh, slap on the on the tower. And actually, Ectelion is uh, going inside the jeans now, boys. Oh, a slap here would be better. I don't know about the commitment against the fortress. Maybe he's relying too much on the on the Glunge uh, Shake Foundation. But with the Shake Foundation, I want to see how much damage he will be able to deal to the fortress. I want to see that. Shake Foundation. He was also playing against uh, Luxus two days ago. He was also winning against Luxus two days ago on the channel. Or Luxa. Shake Foundation has been used, but it's of course not as effective against fortresses as well as, as it is, for example, against normal buildings. It's also Gimli. Nazgul, level 6, has the Morgul Bleed. And Mouth of Sauron is going to be taken down. Lur uh, not Lourdes. Gimli is getting level 2. Frodo from the Shire is gone now. And the fortress is still under attack. And Archangel. And, you know, they don't even call GG or something. They just leave. We have the Goblin player, Ectidion, at the bottom side. Against the Yellow Mordor player, Archangel, at the top side. And that's the first time we see Sorowile in BFME 2. It's a map from Rise of the Witch King. With those ship rides. There is also Tavern. Uh, I mean, a Dale Tower with Corsairs protecting that. Same also on the left side. And, of course, if you want to, if you want to, you can also recruit some transport ships and go. Glorious, yeah. Hey, Merkin, Mergin. Mergin, are you up for BFME 1 games? Uh, I would like to stream BFME 1 once again. I have many, many people asking me, Shanks, why are, why are you not streaming BFME 1? Especially people from YouTube, they are actually interested in that kind of content. So we might also host like a small BFME 1 tournament for a change. Would be nice. Two slaughterhouses, orc pit, orc pit. Cave pads being used for scouting purposes. We have two tunnels, three tunnels, four tunnels into the first fissure. What is this fan remake of Lord of the Ring music? Yes. It's like a fan re remake which is royalty free, which is the reason why we are allowed to use it on the stream. I cannot use the original Lord of the Ring music on the stream because it's copyrighted. And when you use copyrighted, copyrighted music in the stream, you might get banned. And I don't want to get banned yet. Is BFME 2 even big enough, big enough for a pro scene? There is no professional player in any Battle for Middle Earth game. Professional player means when you get paid for playing. So nobody is getting paid for playing, so there is no professional. I would call them expert players when they are really, really great skilled players. You are only professional if you are competing in our tournaments, which are with cash prizes. That makes you to a professional player. If you win many, many tournaments, you might actually make great amount of money in long terms, you know? Because roundabout... A thousand dollars at least being invested into the tournaments, at least a year from us. So we are doing many, many tournaments and last year it was $1,400 we were actually giving away for the winners and for the runner-ups. So $1,400 is not, of course, not enough for making a living of that, but still it's good, you know. You are still playing your favorite game and you have the chance to win a couple of bucks, dude. For a small community like we have in BFME scene, it's pretty nice. Fissure, Cave Trolls. And we have Orc Pit, Orc Pit, Orc Pit. Uh, into the third Orc Pit, coming up next. If you win paid uh, championships, yeah, but you are only able to win at some certain times and, and not for playing generally. When you are like in a professional team, for example, in League of Legends, you are like in a, in a G2 club, for example, right? And you are a professional player, you are in a in them in their house, you are being paid and you are being sponsored for playing the game. Even when you're not participating in the tournament, because also that also that is not every month a tournament, you know. There are some major championships, like twice or three times a year. There is a league going on, which happens like once a week or once a month. Uh, so you don't play every single day, but you still get paid every single day, even because you are a professional player. And that's called professional, because then you make a real big money, you know what I'm saying? Then you can make like a hundred thousand dollars a month, easily. And you have those big sponsors going on, you know? A troll cage coming up. He was not going... Actually, he was cancelling the orc pits and going for the... Uh, for the troll cage. 
Yeah, the, the VIP badge is not permanent. <laughs> not scam. It's not permanent. Because I was making the VIP badge uh, channel point reward when we had no bets going on. Then Twitch actually came up with the channel point betting system, which gives you the chance to win those points in no time. Like all you gotta do is put like a big amount on the on the underdog and the underdog wins and boom you have like hundred thousand points won just like that you know what i'm saying so nowadays getting collected getting those channel points collected is way way easier than it was when i was first making those channel rewards so with this logic we would have just like vips in the chat in like two weeks you know and i want the vip badge to be something special i want i want it you know when everybody has a Badge, then nobody has a badge. Where are you from, bro? Uh, from, bro? I'm living in Germany, but I was born in Turkey. So I'm a Turkish guy living in Germany, long story short. Cave troll, slapping. Looks like got destroyed by Sauron. I wouldn't say destroyed, but it was also not it was also not weeks ago. It was like a couple of days ago. Like a week ago, max. Okay, trolls, for days. We have now trolls also from the motor player. So the yellow, the yellow pants against the blue pants. I gotta be honest, I like the mountain trolls a bit more. You see him hitting him actually. Oh, this guy is actually immune to get knocked back. Falcon, welcome. The troll gets smashed. And the mortal troll is victorious. Just like that. Haradrim Palace coming up next. We have two Orc Pits, Troll Cage, and Haradrim Palace for Mordor so far. And yeah, I'm actually also... Oh, what is the build doing here? Hey, the build, the build is like, I'm going to the beach, guys. Let, I'm gonna take, you know, get some uh, girls from the beach. And the build is getting slapped. Nobody is going for the ship rides. I would love to see that. For how long have you been playing BFME 2? I'm I was actually never playing BFME 2 actively, I gotta be honest, you know? And that was also never the purpose of this channel. I was creating this channel to um yeah, I mean my TV channel's reason was to commentate games, which was pretty much starting with like normal games between between friends. You know, when when they were playing, I was commentating, I was playing some sometimes myself, but most of the time I was commentating. It was actually going up and up. Until we were able to host like big tournaments for like big cash prizes for the people. It's like a competitive scene <clears throat> because I was always watching those esport games, you know, from League of Legends or from CSGO when there were commentators commentating the game. And I was always jealous. I was like, okay, guys, this is actually quite interesting. Why, why don't we have this for our game? You know what I'm saying? I was jealous for the game. And I wanted to create some sort of competition to the uh, big esports channels, you know? And of course, I'm also organizing those tournaments and hosting those tournaments and uh, managing those tournaments too. So it's not only about me casting those games, but also about hosting those games and everything else around that. But it's, it's fun. I enjoy that. Yeah, ships are not uh, the best units in the game, to be honest, yeah. The troll is running it down. Thank you, Benzi. Appreciate that. Yeah, he's losing a lot of builders, but the trolls, White Man of Dunland summon, not the best summon, of course, in the game when there are trolls nearby and they're gonna smash you on the ground all the time. Not the best thing in the world. Hello, Sharky. Welcome. Oh, look at this troll fights. They are literally trolling. You know what I'm saying? Trolling. This lot house has been taken down. Oh my goodness, look at this stat. I've been playing BFME 2 for 5 years, not consistently. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, you know. I think uh, having tournaments going on is also a motivation for the people, for the players, to keep playing all the time, to compete in those tournaments and to eventually win something, you know. It's not only about the money, at least not for me. For me, it's about we do something that we like. And this is, of course, Battle for Mid Love related content. I like those games a lot. I like old. Oh, he, look at this. The guy was slapping two trolls at the same time. And Arki will be defeated. Guys, guys, guys. Dude, Ectelion is making it again. And that's gonna be a 3 3 score. And we're gonna go for the final game now. Okay, it's gonna be the final game. 
I like those games a lot because when there is nothing one-sided, when they are losing, winning, losing, winning, it makes them games so much more interesting in my opinion and more entertaining at the same time. So we have the yellow model play Archangel against the blue Dwarven player Exilion. That's the same matchup again, like we have seen two games ago, in which Dwarves were able to win against Mordor. So, so far, Mordor in this series was not able to win one time yet against Dwarves. But maybe they can do that in this game number seven. I think Aragorn on DFME2 is the best hero because he's so tanky and hits like a track. He's, uh, trust me, there is no competition. If you want to have an Aragorn who is extremely tanky and hitting like a truck, then you need to play Aragorn in battle for Middle Earth 1. With the Anduril Sword from the Spellbook of Rohan and the Blade Master active, this guy is just crazy tanky. Crazy tanky. That is not, like, that's the only hero in battle for Middle Earth 1 who can tank a Breath Fire with Ignite from Balrog. And yeah, Balrog is not the same Balrog like in BFME 2 or Rise of the Witch King, trust me. The Balrog is also much more insane. Guardians coming up first. Two Mineshafts, th three Mineshafts, uh, the third one coming up after the Hall of Warriors. On the other side, we see the same opening from Mordor. Two Orc Pits and Slaughterhouses. Orcs are quite cost efficient they cost only 60 in 30 command points, so you can spam them all the time. But again, they are only about uh, that, you know. They are not good when it comes to fight against the mighty guardians of the Dwarven faction. Also, when it comes to destroy the enemy mineshafts. Because mineshafts, once again, are the tankiest resource buildings in the entire game. Orcs are leading forward. Um, yeah, pretty good actually. For Mordor, just scout the area with your builders. Battle for Middle Earth 1, Balrog can flatten a complete fortress base solo, yeah. I mean, that's the real Balrog, you know what I'm saying? Give me one Anduril Aragorn, 18 will track with tank armor, yes. <laughs> Through that. Aragorn is just so, so tanky. Like, I was playing the other day, like a couple of days ago, Rohan is Rohan against seven hard armies in Battle for Middle Earth 1 for the YouTube channel, off screen. And I was just exper experiencing that myself. Like, the, the amount of damage he's able to deal while being extremely tanky at the same time is just crazy, dude. Just crazy. Like, he can kill uh, 10 Gandalf solo. Mineshaft will be scouted. Plus level 10 army of the dead summon, yes. And also army of the dead in BFME 1 is just much more powerful. I mean, the ultimate summons in Battle for Middle Earth 1 are so much more powerful than in BFME 2 and or in Rise of the Witch King, which kind of makes sense because in this game, BFME 2 and Rise of the Witch King, you have two of them. So you can also summon Balrog and uh, the Dragon, for example, or uh, you can summon uh, in Rise of the Witch King the Wolf. The summon Dragon, the Balrog. Like you have so many. Orcs everywhere, but don't attack the Fortress like that. That's a waste of time. Orcs, they need ages. I will be used for defense against those guardians and archers. With archers, I mean. He's trying to defend himself. Is this version 3 or version 2? Is that even a version 3 yet, Sauron? I've, no, I've not seen this before. I mean, uh, Ectelion wanted to send me the version 3, the beta patch. But I don't, I don't like that. Because I don't like the fact that I need to place the file and remove the file and place the file and remove the file again, you know, I don't like this. This was kind of painful in the Rise of the Witch King League we had a couple of months ago. Just like, outdated, replace it, download that, replace... Oh, he was able to get all the money from the creep, by the way, the yellow model player. I wanna, I wanna use it when it's finished. Until then, I'm not gonna use it. Okay. Mineshaft is in a safe spot for now. But again, he's gonna do the same situation, right? He's building a well in the archer range. Oh, that's good. And when it's when it's like that, when I just kinda you know switch from the pet switcher, that's what I like to see a lot. That's also easy for everybody, you know. You need to make it easy because people are lazy. I don't want to download this file, remove the other file. Hey, look at that! Sleet26, thank you so much for the raid, my dude! Welcome, welcome, look at that! Alex shall not, ladies and gentlemen, is finally making it back to the Twitch stream. Alex, is always nice to see in the chat. 
Guys, thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. I hope you had a great stream, Sleet. Uh, I think you are streaming the Age of uh, the Ring, right? Age of the Ring Grand Finals or something like that. And we are here for BFME 2, guys. Right now, BFME 2 on the patch 1.09 version 2.0. That's the patch we are using in a best of seven series between Ectelion and Archangel. Show matches, nothing too crazy, nothing too spicy. Just having some normal games going on. But I was I was watching you the other day, Slate. Each of the ring uh, stream. Who won? Evidera. Claim of the West. Alex won the match. Alex, the man of the match. Ale That's why Alex left, by the way, BFME to our Rise of Twitch game, because in those games he was never able he was never able to win. Alex finally found a game in which he's able to win a tournament. <laughs> Alex shall not. Congratulations, bro. I like Alex. He's the best man of the best play in Rise of the Witch King, by the way. Now, he was always participating in the in the Rise of the Witch King tournaments also for like two years, uh, like two years ago, in every single one of them. And he used to play Man of the West all the time. Is he still playing Man of the West in, in the Age of the Ring mod as well? Or is he going with Random finally? Because he was always pre-picking the Man of the West faction in Rise of the Witch King. Every single time. Look at this positioning from Dwarves, guys. That's crazy. Well behind for the sustain. Extra over spam. Mineshaft to bring more reinforcements from the, from the Hall of Warriors. It's just crazy. So, wow, well, you are telling me that there are better players than Videra? I mean, Videra is the most tryhard player for sure. I've never seen anybody trying hard more than Videra. <laughs> but you are so right about me not winning Rise of the Witch tournaments. I always come up short. <laughs> yeah, but it's always nice to see you on the chat, Alex. I miss you, man. I miss you. I miss also your meme videos for the YouTube channel. You are the original memer, you know. You are like the tier one memer of this me seeing. I'm happy that you are participating and winning those tournaments in Age of the Ring, but I'm also kind of sad that you kind of left uh, me to the Rise of the Witch King for that. Age of the Ring is too confusing, too many factions, too many uh, different units, but I believe if you get into that, you will enjoy, you will, you know, enjoy it, I think. It's also a bit too confusing for me. <clears throat> I have to admit something. Today, after the work, I was trying two times to finish off the Age of the Ring campaign, the Two Towers, the Helm's Deep mission. Okay, guys? I have to admit this, okay? And I failed two times. And I this gets me so mad. Like, amazingly designed. Looks amazing, by the way. It's so accurate, you know, to the films. But it's so scripted at the same time. What I'm trying to say with that is, you are forced to play a certain gameplay. You have no freedom, you know what I'm saying? You are for doomed. You are not able to leave your castle. You are not able to do that. You are always like, it's like like a robot, you know, you need to do this, do this, do this, do this, you know. Uh, you have no freedom. When it comes to play the Helm's Deep in Battle for Middle of One, you have freedom. You can leave out, you can leave the castle, you can go right out with your Rohirrim, recruit whatever you want, you know. And then everything is so scripted. And of course, I also played bad, I gotta be honest. And I also failed, yeah. I mean, I failed twice. I'm trying to find excuses now. But it's it's from the design, it's amazing. Glorian is here, level 1, but it's gonna level up in no time. Watch this. Pew! Oh my goodness, the slap. Kill the slaughterhouse and watch watch the XP he will get, guys, please. Boom, 3.5, just like that. <laughs> If you want Helm's Deep, it's just rush their bases the moment they spawn. Now, yeah, but you have much more freedom, you know, that's what I'm trying to say. In Give Me One, you are able to play the way you want, you know. You can make Rohirrim only, you can make Arches only, you can make that, you can make this, you can open the gate, close the gate. Then, like, in Age of the Ring, it was like that. When this happens, you lose. When this happens, you lose again. When this happens, you lose again. Like, there is so many, so much script, you know, in this, in this mission. And when you, when something goes off meta, when something unexpected happens, for example, I don't know, like explosive mine detonates next to you a bit earlier than it should, then you lose.
Oh, but Ecterion also lost this area. I mean, uh, yeah, he lost this area, but it's okay. He is having lots of units around this side. Hobbit. And look at that. He's building yet another Hall of Warriors at the bottom right side. The Fimone of Steam is cool because you can do tons of stuff defending just one spot of running. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm say trying to say. Like, you have the freedom. You, you can decide the gameplay you want to you wanna play, you know? It's not scripted. When it's too scripted, I don't like that. Like, when I have no freedom, when I'm forced to play this, what they are telling me to play every single minute is scripted. And you are not allowed to... Like, for example, I can explain you guys. Elven warriors are getting there, you know? The reinforcement, just like in the films. So Heidi is coming with Elven Warriors. Then you are forced to keep them at a deeping wall. You can't place them anywhere else. You are not allowed to. You know? You can't place them on top of the gate. And you need to walk all the way to inside the Helm's Deep to the Armory to buy upgrades. And then you need to go all the way back again. So, so much traveling, so much talking. Aragorn has to talk to 10 heroes before the game actually starts. Then you go to Theoden, walk there. Then go to Eowyn, walk there. Holy moly. Don't do that, you know? It's just too scripted. It's so amazingly designed. Why why it has to be so annoying to play and boring to play at the same time? I don't get it. Big commitment. Oh my goodness, man. Ectelion, I cannot believe that. He was down 3-1. And I believe at the end of this game, at the end of this game, he will be leading 4-3 against Archangel. That's crazy. Oh, look at this guy. Gloin, we see him every single game, boys. Every single game he's included. Builder is going down as well. I also love summoning the army of the dead. Early Minas did it with the increased timer and scripted one get. Uh, I mean, I was always trying to win without army of the dead. But also in Minas did it battle, you had the freedom, you know. You, you could just make golden knights. You could make a thousand trebuchets. Like, you could build whatever you want. And here you have like a one building and you have like four selected units. You are forced to build them. Now you are forced to stay there on the spot. You are not, you know, that's not only about the units or the power points you have, you know. It's about the entire gameplay, which is so scripted that you have no choice of playing it the way you want, you know. And then when, uh, like, one minute, hold the gate for one minute. And then when, then the gate explodes anyway. But in the Helm's Deep mission in BFME 1, you could just hold your wall entirely. So you could defend your wall without it getting destroyed, you know what I'm saying? Arky will be leaving the game and that's it, boys.